it's been hard, right? Having to listen to my voice. <laughs> How many weeks in a row? But the thing is, it's the like that's not for it. this semester. Like, it's the last lecture. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> last lecture. <laughs> like, it's, it's not. Okay, see you guys next semester. Nope. Good luck. Bye. <laughs> Um, burn injuries are very prevalent. 486,000 people require medical attention um, from burns every year. Um, and we're talking all age groups, we're not just talking about adults, right? Young children and older adults are at higher risk for burn injuries. Why do you think? So young children, it's a safety kind of issue. They're not aware as aware of their surroundings. So you have to keep a close eye on those. Oh yeah, my, that my toddler loves to go straight for the oven yeah. every time. I Why open older it. adults, guys? Less sensation. Less sensation, um, and mobility is an issue. So falls and then falling into something hot um, happens um, frequently. So when it comes to burns. Our job is not only to care for the patients, assess and care for the patients, we also have to look at preventative. So when you are educating these um, patients before you discharge them home, if they're, if they're good enough to go, to go home from the ER, you should spend some time talking about prevention. What caused the injury? How are we going to prevent that from happening again? I just pretty much talked about most of this. Okay. So there's going to be some rehabilitation through reconstructive surgery and rehabilitation programs and we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about which patients are going to need that extra amount of care. So let's first talk about the different classifications of burns. So first degree burns, what do you think about when you say when I say first degree burns, what kind of burn comes to mind? Sunburn. A sunburn, good. So with sunburns, when you push on the burn, it blanches right? But the color comes back when you let go. So that's how you know it's a first degree burn. Um, pain is relieved with cooling, not ice, but cool. Um, ice actually will extend or increase the depth of the burn. So you don't want to use large amounts of ice. Did you know if you go tanning and you feel like you got burnt, even out in the sun, if you go inside and take as hot a shower as you can tolerate, I worked with tanning school, and we had a lot of education on that. So if guys get tanning, and butt gets burnt, go home and take a shower real quick. Oh, jeez. First degree burns can have blisters, but they're not common. And we usually treat those with topical antibiotics, and they get better in just a few days. Is that like a curling iron burn? Yeah. Second degree burns involve the entire epidermis and varying portions of the dermis. Um, they're normally very painful and they normally have blisters. We do not pop blisters in a burn. Do not. Why? Infection. Yes. Correct. The surface of the blister um, actually will protect the skin underneath. So if the fluid leaks out, while you're dressing the patient or whatever, that's okay. Just make sure that the surface, that skin surface, stays on top. Can you bring on popsicles? I'm working in ER, and part of my job is to do burns and raisin, and we actually do the raisin and blister. Okay, but we're talking about the patient. We don't want the patient popping the blisters. That's done under a sterile technique. Uh, Second degree burns have edema, um, they're mottled, there's probably weeping involved, and there may be some scarring and depigmentation possible. These obviously are gonna take a lot, a little bit longer to get better, a couple weeks before they start to heal. <coughs> Third degree burns are full thickness burns. You have total destruction of the epidermis, the dermis, and underlying tissue, and these are the ones that lack sensation. Um, they appear leathery, sometimes a little bit of charring, edema, and these will need grafting or some sort of reconstruction. 
sometimes the reconstruction is not necessarily for aesthetic reasons, but it can be because of function. Um, if you get a burn, like on fingers especially, if it tightens up because of that scarring tissue, they may have to have that revised so that they can have mobility again. And then fourth degree burns, luckily we don't see as many of, deep burn and necrosis, and this extends down into the muscle or bone. Ouch. Yeah. These, um, these deep of burns sometimes require amputation. Grafting usually is not possible because of the depth of the burn. Evaluating burns, we need to determine which um, burns we can treat in our local emergency departments and which one needs to go to a burn center. So these are some of the criteria that we, you would use in order to determine whether your patient needs to go to a burn center. So let's think about that a little bit. So if I have a younger client especially and or, and or I have a client who has severe burns to things like um, fingers and toes, large portions of body, those patients are gonna to need to be seen by a burn center. Because they're gonna need close follow-up, they're probably gonna need plastics, there's gonna be skin grafting, there's, yes. So pretty involved. Again, when you are looking to determine how deep this burn is, we can't necessarily see through the patient's skin we may not know how deep it gets into the dermis. So ask questions like, how long was the part in contact with the thermal injury that caused the burn? Um, what, what caused the burn? Was it a flame or was it a scalding liquid? How hot was the liquid? You may know that, if, especially if it's an industrial type accident, you may know how hot that liquid is. Um, duration of contact, obviously. And then everybody's thickness of skin is a little bit different, right? Not everybody has the same amount of subcutaneous tissue. So someone who has thinner skin is gonna have a deeper um, burn injury than someone who has thicker subcutaneous. Okay, have you all heard of the rule of nines? Yes. Yes, so you're gonna need to look at this next picture and kind of memorize the rule of nines in order to answer some of the questions on your exam. The other, part, the other um, method that I see used is the Palmer method. That's where you're taking your hand and you're holding it over an area of burn and each um, area that covers your palm is 1%. But we're gonna use the rule of nine. So this is the picture you're gonna use when you're determining the rule of nines. So when it says 18%, that's the entire leg front and back, okay? Same thing with the arm. That's the entire arm front and back. So if I say like a forearm burn divided in half, be four and a half percent. If I say just the front of the head or the back of the head, then that's like four and a half percent. Forty-year-old male sustains burns to his anterior torso following an explosion of a fuel tank. The burn area is brown and leather-like. The client does not complain of pain. The nurse should conclude that the client has burns that are. Full thickness. for anterior and 18% for posterior. So if it's front and back of the torso, it would have been 36%. Well, we're saying full thickness because it's brown and leather-like. Yes.
So chemical, thermal, radiation, these burns <coughs> are gonna be treated a little bit differently. Obviously, if it's a chemical injury, the burn's been caused by chemical splashing on me, what do I need to think about? Um, yeah. Rinsing that off, get that chemical off the skin so there's less um, <coughs> surface area covered with it. So I'm getting all that chemical off, right? If your patient is fully clothed and then has chemical <coughs> dust on them, then I need to get that removable clothing off and then rinse before I'm, I'm safe to say that that, that has now decreased their chance for a secondary burn. Um, had a patient who worked at one of our tire companies in Finley and he got doused with steam, like boiling <coughs> water. Uh, he was fully clothed and had boots on and they took him into their shower and they, they showered him with his clothes on. What they didn't think about was all that hot water went down his pants into his boots and so his feet were just soaked in this hot water. They never unclothed him. They took a burn blanket, threw it over the top of him and then brought him to the ER. So when we got him undressed and got down to the boots, his boot, the inside of his boot was actually adhered to his feet. So we had to cut around what we could, and then we shipped him off to a burn center. I believe he ended up with amputations of both feet. All because he had All something because, spilled on him as yes. he went in the shower. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so be careful about that. Um, thermal includes electrical. So what's gonna be different with electrical is you're gonna have two different points. The point in which the electricity went in and the point in which the electricity came out. So if you know your patient has an electrical burn, you need to do a thorough, thorough skin assessment and look for both of those types of, of burns. One might be more obvious than the other. <coughs> so this is just a um, picture of the skin and the different areas of the skin and the, how they're named as zones. So you don't necessarily need to memorize that, but it's just a nice pictogram. All right, so what makes a burn a major burn? <coughs> major burn means that more than 30% of the body is involved. So when you have more than 30% of the body surface involved, you're gonna get systemic responses on top of local responses. Because what the body does is those cells that are damaged release cytokines, and those cytokines um, actually cause your immune system to kick in and go overboard, so then you get inflammation on top of um, the original damage. Um, and these actually can release, um, release these cytokines, get it released, and then they can actually even block your um, renal um, vasculature, so you can cause kidney damage because of all these cytokines just being released. You have what, sorry? Kidney damage? Kidney damage. So, in a major burn, you're gonna see fluid and electrolyte shifts. Which electrolytes do you think are gonna be most involved? Sodium, potassium. Sodium and potassium. So when I'm trying to figure out how much fluid to give my patient, or um, yeah, when I'm trying to figure out how much fluid to give my patient, I'm looking to see if my patient's fluid levels are back to normal, I need to keep an eye on sodium and potassium. Also cardiovascular effects that we're gonna talk about, pulmonary injury, because um, when I get a burn, depending on what the method was for the burn, Patients will sometimes inhale that hot um, thermal energy, and so they'll end up with burns to their nasal cavity, to their upper um, airways. So I'm gonna talk to you about how we look for that. Carbon monoxide poisoning. Does anybody know what a patient looks like who's co positive carbon monoxide poisoning? Blue, red, cherry red, yep. 
Yes, because the carbon dioxide is. <laughs> yes, and so it's kind of caught there. You can see it. Renal and GI alterations, immunological alterations, and then of course it's going to affect your patient's thermal regulation because you've lost surface area of your skin and your skin is what regulates your temperature, right? So if I lose too much of my skin surface, I'm going to have problems keeping my temperature. So this is a nice layout showing you what happens after a burn that can lead to burn shock. So there are three phases of burn injury. You should know the difference between all three phases. The first phase is the emergent or resuscitative phase. And it starts at the onset of injury and it goes until the fluid resuscitation is completed. The acute or immediate phase goes from the beginning of diuresis until the wounds are closed. So that's a pretty long phase. And then the rehab phase is from the wound closure to the return to optimal physical and psychosocial adjustment. And again, depending on how severe the burn is, this could go on for years. So emergent resuscitative phase, you wanna prevent injury to the rescuer. So you come across someone who's on fire don't go rushing in there without knowing what your plan is going to be to get that fire knocked out on that patient because you're putting yourself at risk, right? So what do you want to do? Somebody's on fire. What do you want? Yeah, talk them through it. Stop, drop, and roll. What if there's electrical um, leads in the way? What should you do? <clears throat> if you feel that you can do it safely, you can grab like a piece of wood or a tree limb to move electrical current out of the way. But again, think of yourself first. Injuring you is not gonna help the person who's already been injured. We wanna worry about ABCs. Always, always, always airway, breathing, and circulation. These patients, if they have even the least amount of soot or burning of hair, facial hair near their nose, you should assume that they've had damage to their airway. And if they have damage to their airway, they should be intubated as soon as possible. Because once that swelling starts, it's gonna be hard to intubate that patient. So when in doubt, they're gonna be intubated just to protect their airway. You wanna start oxygen and two large bore IVs. You're gonna get significant amounts of fluid replacement. You want to remove restrictive objects and cover the wound. Survey the entire body system. I'm looking at their skin, but I'm also listening to their lungs. I'm also listening to their heart. I'm checking for pulses. So just because they've had a burn, don't concentrate just on the burn. You have to do a full head to toe assessment. And assume that anybody who's had a fall or like if they've been in a blast injury, that they have a cervical spinal injury. So it's obvious, the burn will be obvious, but you should think also about cervical spine. So this is what I was talking about. Do you see this hair's kind of burnt off, <laughs> this yeah. mustache here, and then there's um, blackened mucus here inside the nose, and then this one. Um, there's significant burn to the face and, and around the mouth, and if you look inside, there's a lot of swelling. So again, we want to get those patients intubated to protect the airway. <clears throat> so the patient comes to your ER and fluid resuscitation has begun. Foley catheter should be inserted because we need to have an accurate intake and output for these patients. And if they have a burn greater than 20 to 25%, you should think about putting an NG tube in place because ileus is something that can happen secondary to a significant burn. They can also get ulcers. 
secondary to burn. So again, getting that NG in before things get swollen and your patient's not gonna be eating or drinking orally anyways, so you can give nutrition. Patients with electrical burns should have an ECG because depending on what path that electrical energy took could have gone through the heart. And if it goes through the heart and touches that electrical conduction, it can cause <clears throat> dysrhythmias. So you wanna make sure that there's not been ischemia or major damage to the electrical components of the heart. Pain medication should all be IV administered, not oral. And you need to think about psychosocial and emotional support for the patient and for the family. Like I said, this is gonna be a long recovery, so they're gonna need that assistance. So vital signs and hemodynamic status. So I'm monitoring blood pressure, and then depending on how sick my patient is, um, some of them may need central lines and CBP monitoring, again, to help me figure out my fluid resuscitation. <coughs> Remember that some of these patients who come to you with burns have other underlying chronic illnesses, hypertension, congestive heart failure, previous MIs. So fluid resuscitation is gonna be more difficult to figure out for them. Assess the extent of the burn. And there is a nice chart um, in your book 57-5 that goes through every nursing diagnosis and has goals and interventions. So I would peruse that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I did get it. It's always the your turn call. <coughs> oh, well, that's wrong. I didn't give you a statement. I just said, there's the rationale. Okay. It's a little backwards. You just have to find it in a different area as a person. <laughs> Potential complications during the emergent resuscitative phase. Acute respiratory failure. How would I know my patient has respiratory failure? Uh, their CO2 is greater than 60. Their pulse oxes are dropping despite giving large amounts of oxygen, right? Distributive shock like you would see in sepsis, acute kidney injury, and how would I determine that? Urine output. output. Decreased urine output, elevated BUN and creatinine. Good. Compartment syndrome, I don't know if you guys have talked about that in the past before, <laughs> um, but what that is is where there's so much swelling all the way around a particular body part that it cuts off circulation to that body part. Um, so compartment syndrome is a serious injury that needs to be assessed for. I'm sorry? The escharotomy. They do a fasciotomy if it's just regular compartment syndrome, but in burns, it's because of charring and they, they cut through the escar. But you're right. Right, so they may not have that, they, they still are gonna have that pain below it because they're not getting circulation. Okay, so burn shock is caused from third spacing. So fluids that should be in the vascular space have now been pushed out into the tissues and the patient will appear as if they're hypovolemic. Again, because it's not in the vascular space anymore, it's out in the tissues. 24 to 36 hours is when it's most likely to occur. Blood vessels can get damaged, 
which increases capillary permeability. And again, the capillaries then become leaky and they allow those fluids to just move outside of the vessel instead of staying where they're supposed to be. Should be looking at water, sodium, and, and um, serum albumin. That will help you understand exactly how much of the third spacing is going on. Hematocrit and blood viscosity increases. Just like you would see with dehydration, right? Hematocrit levels go up. Greater than 40% burn causes a decreased cardiac contract contractability and decreased cardiac output. And again, we talked about electrical burns. So let me show you what an escherotomy looks like. So this is a patient who had significant burns circumferential around their torso. And so they take a scalpel and they cut through the escar to allow movement of the lung of the ribs so they can breathe again. I'm sorry? No, No, there's not. I have no idea. I'd be highly unlikely. I don't know if you can see or not, but this patient is traked up here. Um, so there's been, and there's burns that extend down here into the groin and the thigh. So if you're talking body surface area, that's got to be at least 70, 80% of their body surface with burns. So because the, the skin becomes tight, um, leathery, and hard, it does not allow any movement. So if you get that in the area of the rib cage, obviously, your patient's not going to be able to expand their chest in order to breathe. So that's why they did the escarotomy. Renal failure. Again, we talked about those cytokines, but the other thing you have to worry about is myoglobin. Myoglobin will be broken down from um, muscle damage, and that can collect. Um, hemoglobin will break down, and those things will go through the bloodstream, and it will block the renal tubules. <coughs> Acute intermittent phase, 48 to 72 hours after the injury. Got to continue doing a very thorough assessment. There is still going to be significant edema, and even if you didn't have uh, emergent compartment syndrome, it can develop days later. So you still need to keep an eye on those distal pulses, cap refill. What can develop later? Compartment syndrome. We need to start thinking about how we're going to treat these wounds, prevent infection. <clears throat> Remember, your body's in a hypermetabolic um, state, so what, do I, what else do I need to worry about? Uh, Nutritional needs. They're going to need more calories. Our goal is to restore fluid balance, prevent infection, try to modulate the hypermetabolism, relieving pain, and promoting mobility. So if I can get some movement of some of those areas that are a little stiff before they start to get to the point where I can't move them at all. I can start moving some of those areas now that I know that they're gonna, the edema is gonna start going down. So you want to keep working on that. So the guy with the escarotomy, whatever. How do you do get mask? So you, like if it's like full fake mask, it's not like you're gonna be able to get like do an IV on the arm or anything. How do you give somebody <coughs> like that med like medication? You can do an IO. Like IO. So you would have to use like an IO. But the problem with IOs is that they can't stay in place for too long. Um, so 
I mean, there were portions of his neck that may not have been involved. You might be able to slip an IJ or, or a central line in one of those. Which brings, um, <coughs> brings up the idea of how am I monitoring their vital signs if they've got full thickness burns to their arms and their legs, right? You don't want to put a blood pressure cuff over the top of that and have that inside of that blood pressure cuff just sitting on that open skin. So what we normally do is we take clean sterile gauze and we put it around the wound area, put the blood pressure cuff over the top of that. That's the best that you can do, especially if you've got arms and legs involved, you don't have any other choices. <coughs> acute respiratory failure and acute respiratory distress syndrome, we've talked about those before. Heart failure again, um, and pulmonary edema because of the fluid overload and the fluid shifting, right? Visceral damage, remember again with those electrical burns, depending on what portion of the body it went through, it could have gone across the intestinal area and caused damage to things like the liver, a large intestine and a small intestine. Um, and so you might see ischemia secondary to an electrical burn. We want to do rehab as, as early as possible um, because remember they're going to be going through rehab for a long, long period of time. Some of these patients are going to need reconstructive surgery to improve function. Constantly, constantly being vigilant about how we care for these wounds. Um, hand hygiene we talk about all the time, but when you're talking about a burn patient, it is the most significant hand hygiene you can do. We're scrubbing before we put on sterile gloves to do wound changes. I mean, you have to be very vigilant. Hair should be pulled back. Um, you should have, you know, contact precautions on so that you're not touching any part of that open wound. So your patient's gonna have generalized dehydration, reduced blood volume and hemoconcentration. Again, going back to that hematocrit, you're gonna see that start to climb because of how thick their blood is. Decreased urine output, and depending on how much trauma there was, you could end up with hyperkalemia. Sodium get, gets trapped in the edema, and so you'll end up with hyponatremia. And your overall ABG will probably show a metabolic acidosis. All right, so let's talk about how we're gonna replace this fluid. So one of the formulas we use is a Parkland formula, and yes, you should memorize this formula. So you take lactated ringers, four milliliters, times the kilogram body weight, and then times their body surface area. Yep, the burn, total total burn surface area, oh, yeah. Total burn. yeah. Half of that amount you're gonna give in the first eight hours, a fourth you're gonna give in the next eight hours, and then the last eight hours you're gonna give the, the second fourth. You do that math, yep. and then you take half of what you got. Yes. Okay, and then you take a fourth of that, a fourth of the total, and then the oh, other fourth of the total. Okay. okay, so I'm going to show you an example. Okay. Hang on. What are you doing? Hang, Hang on. on. Hang on. Okay, take some time. Figure it out.
we doing? You work it out for a lot of this. I got it. All right. Yes, it's a significant amount of fluid. So don't let that deter you when you're figuring it out. You're looking at it going, that can't be right. And it really is. So the total fluid that you're giving over the first 24 hours is what? 7,200. Half of that you're giving in the first eight hours, so that's what? 3,600. And you're doing that over eight hours, so how many milliliters per hour is that? 450. You take the 3,600, divide it by eight, give 450 milliliters. The second eight hours, you should be giving how much? 1,800. 1,800. And how many milliliters per hour is that going to be? 225. 225. And then the last one is the same as the second one. The last 1,800 and at 225. All right, has everybody got that? Yes. Same as the second, 1,800 and 225. Again, you're looking to see, I mean, it doesn't matter how much, if your patient's dehydrated, you should be using this formula. If you're seeing a fluid shift, it's bad enough to be using a fluid replacement. Remember that formula is just a guide. It's not the all, end all to be all. So I'm monitoring vital signs. How often do you think I should monitor? Every hour. Every hour. So during this intermediate phase, fluid is gonna re-enter the vascular space from the interstitial space. And so I might get some hemodilution. What does that mean? It's gonna dilute the blood. So again, I've got, I had a fluid shift out of the intervascular space. Now I've got a fluid shift back into the intravascular space. Go back and look at that sodium and that potassium um, and help to correct that hematocrit based on what's happening with your patient. You should start to get increased urine output. Again, you still have to be aware of natremia, hyponatremia, hypokalemia, and metabolic acidosis. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of some of these things, but we need to clean the wounds. Um, one of the ways that they used to clean the wounds is something called hydrotherapy. I'll show you what that looks like. Use of topical agents, if it's um, not a wound deep into the sub-Q, we can use topical agents for first and second degree burn. We need to do wound debridement. Some of that's gonna be natural because skin will slough off a little bit as, it, um, as the tissue deadens, some of that will slough off. Most of it's gonna be mechanical though, where I need 
someone to actually remove the dead um, tissues until we get down to an area where there's bleeding and there's circulation. Very painful process. And we can even do surgical debridement. Um, again, depending on what, how much of the body surface area there is and how deep it is, they may need to go to surgery to have um, necrotic tissue removed. So here's one of your nursing diagnoses, potential for infection related to loss of skin and microinvasion. Again, the meticulous hand washing, we want to use sterile technique during dressing changes and wound care. And any hair that's near the burn area should be shaved. Just to decrease the chances for infection. We just talked about the blisters. These patients should be given tetanus if they're not up to date on their tetanus. Hypothermia is a problem. Again, you're removing the thermal regulatory organ of the body. So you want your ambient temperature in the rooms to be around 85. I know that's really warm. And then I'm gonna put all this garb on to go in there and treat that patient. But we're trying to protect them from loss of heat. So this is a hydrotherapy tank. Um, they actually even have showers <coughs> now. So they pull the cot in and they use the water to help cleanse the wounds. Um, there is a bit of a jet behind the water so that you can get um, good depth of that water. So yeah, probably not the most comfortable thing in the world, but help to clean the wounds. Yes, so you don't want to do this for longer than 30 minutes because you don't want hypothermia. Thank you for pointing that out. Silvidine cream is one of our um, most popular topicals. It's a silver nitrate or a silver impregnated. Um, they even make dressings with this already in. Um, the actual gauze. Again, it needs to be done sterilely. So when you're doing a dressing change on a burn, you're not taking the ointment and using your fingers and applying it to the gauze. You're using like a tongue depressor or something where you're, you're putting it on the gauze so that you are not touching the portion of the gauze that's gonna be touching the patient. This is a list of some of the other topicals that you might see used. You don't have to memorize that, it's just good information to have. So she has sterile gloves on, that's why she's touching the surface, but she's got sterile gloves on touching the surface of the gauze. And we, we put that impregnated gauze or that, that antibiotic ointment next to the burn and then we use a lot of fluffy kind of curlex fluffs around it just again to prevent um, infection. The other thing you have to worry about with these wounds again is especially like on the fingers and the toes when you're wrapping or dressing, you wanna make sure that you're dressing each individual appendage. You don't wanna wrap them together because the skin surfaces would touch and they could start to adhere or heal to each other. So as you're doing those dressing changes, you need to um, wrap each one individually and then you put a large um, gauze around all of them together. And because they're at risk for um, compartment syndrome, and because you've lost a significant amount of circulation, you've got to be careful when you're putting those dressings on not to put them on too tight. So check frequently for circulation um, on the areas where you put those dressings. Easier said than done when you're all the way down to the fingertips, it's kind of hard to tell. Burned areas should be elevated on pillows. 
give pain meds 30 minutes prior to treatments, again, we're gonna be removing dead tissue and getting down to viable tissue. That's a very painful process. So you wanna make sure that your patient has adequate pain um, control before we do that. IV, usually like morphine's allotted kind of stuff. Psychosocial support, remember these patients, depending again on how much of the surface area has been involved, they're gonna have a decrease in mobility. Um, some of them are gonna have body image issues, depending if it's like a face or you know large portions of their body that are now gonna be significantly scarred for a long period of time. So even if they're not openly um, appear anxious or upset, you should always assume that that will eventually be a problem. So you should talk that through at the beginning. Don't wait till you're ready to discharge them and then say, how are you feeling about that? Lots of support groups and organizations out there to help with some of that discharge planning. Burn pain has been described as one of the most severe forms of acute pain. So we have pain because we're doing um, treatments, dressing changes, wound cleaning. They've got nerve endings. Some of them have nerve endings that are completely exposed, so that increases pain. Has anybody ever had a second degree burn? Even air going across the skin surface causes discomfort. So keep that in mind. So during emergent and acute phases, we should be using IV pain medication. And keep in mind that yes, they're in pain, but they're gonna be in pain constantly, right? So trying to get sleep and trying to get rest is gonna be difficult for them to do also. All right, I can get profound metabolic Issues Again, we talked about um, the breaking down of chemicals in the blood, including the hemoglobin. And again, it can block smaller vessels and it can cause organ damage. So we have to keep an eye on all of those things. Enteral route is preferred method for giving um, nutrition. Home care, what's my ultimate goal with these patients? We talked about that final phase, that rehab phase. What's my goal? Optimal functioning. Back to normal functioning, their activities of daily living. They're able to perform their own activities of daily living and they're able to get back to normal functioning. Let's take a break.